It's been a while. It's How you been? I've been all right. How have you been? I've been doing okay. How's the pandemic treating you? Uh, as, as well as can be, I'm working from home and, uh, I'm working at a place called input, which is a tech and culture website. I'm editing features. Uh, sorry. Uh, I am not doing too much with the grunge these days, although they're always like, uh, talk of TV or documentary projects, but so far nothing has come to fruition. Well, it would uh, be in, in very interesting to see the book turn into a doc, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, there there are people interested, but it's just like getting the right offer and, and stuff like that. And uh, there's also some TV interest, but I'll find out in a couple of weeks about that. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing okay, you know, as far as uh, everything uh, journalism is concerned. I'm still, you know, I still got my job, so. <laughs> there's that. Okay. That is- That can't, is something. Can't complain. Can't complain. Um, I like I said to you on the email. It's hard to get the book in Spanish, man. It's really hard. Um, from I mean, there's I guess the S Pop Ediciones. That's the the version. I, I is it? Um, it's not. I think at some point they they kind of ran out. But, they did. Um, yeah, which is. I guess a good sign, but uh, I hopefully they'll make more. Um, hopefully, hopefully it doesn't look yeah. like it though, because like I said, you know, I saw a copy of it at a record store, you know, via Instagram, and I said to them, "Oh my God, I gotta have that copy," and they uh, said, "You know, we we just sold it," and I was like, "Okay, maybe I'll find it through the internet." Dude, it's sold out everywhere, but I finally oh. managed to get me a good book dealer who <laughs> found a copy oh, wow, of it. Wow. Yeah, I'll have to talk to them and, and see what the story is. Cool. Uh, seems to be doing all right, obviously, uh, there, but I don't think they printed up enough copies, I guess, which is a good problem to have. <laughs> um, it, it definitely but, but is. Thanks. But thank you for searching that out. I appreciate it. Listen, Mark, um, I, I wanted to talk to you sure. about Nevermind because, you know, it's like tomorrow's the 30th anniversary of, of the album. And you did such yes. an amazing job of documenting the Seattle grunge scene and everybody loves our town. And I just wanted to touch base with you and talk a bit about what you remember, how you remember it uh, as far as, you know, documenting it on the book, what it was like, you know, anything that you can share with our Colombian audiences would be of great value and it'd be great to hear you talk about it. Sure. Uh, I mean, it's kind of amazing that it's the 30th anniversary of, of Nevermind. Uh, I wrote my book 10 years ago, or my book came out 10 years ago to celebrate the 20th anniversary. So I, it's kind of unbelievable that it's been a whole decade since then. Uh, you know, it's, it's the album. I, I remember I, I was... I mean, I, this is when I, you know, I, I had gotten, I was in college and then I got a tape with uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit on it. It was like a sampler from the, the label DGC. And I, it was the first song on the tape and I it would play it in my car and just keep rewinding it, rewinding it, rewinding it. It was the best song on the tape. So, and then when Nevermind came out, I remember buying it that week. It came out at a store. I, uh, you know, was going to school near Boston uh, or, and I went into Cambridge and bought it along with the Pixies album, Trump Oman, that also turns 30 at the same time. So uh, another very good album, not quite as good, but uh, in my mind, but uh, not the Pixies best, but uh, yeah. And I just, it was kind of, it's hard to remember, but back then, you know, alternative music like Nirvana was not, you know, I knew it was catching on when I would play that tape in the car and one of my more like, what we would consider like mainstream, like sports loving friends would, would listen to it and like really got into it. So it, it, it kind of was remarkable that it was catching on. So, so they, and of course it just exploded after that. I mean, my, one of my big regrets is that they had a, uh, WFNX, which is the Boston or was the Boston station had a big concert, uh, to celebrate, Uh, the release of the album, but I, I was going to go with a friend and then he bailed. So I didn't go and I never got to see Nirvana. I, I, you know, they, they obviously played New York a bunch of times and I couldn't get tickets and I always assumed they'd be around. And obviously 
that wasn't the case. So, um, yeah, it's it's been a long it's been a long and, and eventful thirty years. That's for sure. Why do you think Nirvana has Nirvana's Nevermind has such appeal? Thirty years on, it continues to be influential and to have an impact on music conversations and music in general. What is it about Nevermind that keeps it updated, fresh, and relevant? I mean, it's still just a great sounding record. You can turn it on. I mean, I hear it all the time. Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily go back and listen to it, but I'll hear it like on, I like to listen to Pandora a lot. So, you know, it'll, it'll come up, you know, the songs will come up on Pandora. And I mean, it smells like teen spirit is just like pretty much as it's one of those songs that, that gets your attention even 30 years later. It's just that good. And the songwriting is incredibly good. And the production is incredibly timeless and it just I, i mean also because of what it represents obviously it was the album that basically ushered in grunge to as a phenomena and you know that along with a little bit later you know t pearl jams 10 came out a little bit before it but it didn't catch on until later but that and and obviously soundgarden's bad motor finger was around the same time so all these albums came out um you know it was a, a very sort of fertile six week stretch i saw somebody posting about this on twitter where like that came out and the red hot chili peppers album came out and uh you know all the all these incredible albums were, were coming out that we, you know we kind of see as classics now and really kind of embody the the 90s and the 90s are always i mean i was alive in the 90s but there are people who weren't and they they look back upon that time you know with with fondness it was in retrospect it seems to have been a lot less <laughs> complicated time no global pandemic or donald trump or a lot There was a Donald Trump, but not, not, in, not in the way he is today. Uh, you know, things of that nature. It was a little bit simpler time, and uh, I think people responded. And obviously, the just the the mythos of Kurt and having you know died by suicide is you know kind of he froze in time as a 27 year old, and you know he he you know became legendary in that in that regard. You know what I think is funny? The fact that Kurt meant Smells Like Teen Spirit to sound pop and yet, you, you know, just as a joke, you, you read this over and over again, the fact that he really wanted to reach that pop sound, but in the same way that he wanted his band to be called Nirvana, you know, like, sort of like an inside joke kind of thing. Um, and, and, it, yeah, and, it, and it became a pop, uh, staple. Yeah. The, the song is, I mean, the, the name is based on, uh, a popular women's deodorant at the time. So, uh, I don't think he knew that exactly when he was writing this, the song, but, um, so it, you know, it's, it's very tongue in cheek. The lyrics are very funny. The, you know, albino mosquito, my libido, things like that. It, you know, it's, a lot of people don't realize because of Kurt's public image and the way he obviously died that he was very, very funny person. And a lot of these people in this grunge scene were very funny, but they had this sort of reputation of being dark and brooding and with the drop D tuning and, and just uh, hair in their eyes. But you know, they were all, I mean, I talked to a lot of them. They were all very funny guys, mostly guys, not all guys, but mostly guys. <laughs> and uh, Kurt Cobain in particular, you know, a lot of people I spoke to for my book wanted to, you know, sort of bust the myth that he was this brooding angsty, uh, you know, voice of a generation when he was just a regular guy to them. Why do you think uh, Nevermind was more popular? You just mentioned that it was like a six-week stretch of a lot of alternative uh, cultural landmarks taking place. But why do you think, for example, you know, Nevermind was bigger than 10? Uh, I mean, I think, again, you have to go back to the time. 
there was, I mean, they were both incredibly popular albums, so I don't know what the final sales figure was, but there was sort of a sense in the alternative and indie scene that Nirvana were the more authentic band and Pearl Jam were kind of the sellouts and, you know, uh, kind of jumping on this train, even though Pearl Jam obviously had all these members of bands like, you know, Green River and Mother Love Bone, who were were pretty seminal in the in the grunge scene. You know, they were they were sort of more seen as a little bit more of a just less authentic. And authenticity was so huge back then. I mean, there's a funny thing like like uh, you know, I was commenting on Twitter. Uh, you know, the the uh, Foo Fighters, obviously who came out of the ashes of, of Nirvana just played like a, a concert for Salesforce, which is some big software company. I saw know, that. I saw yeah, yeah. that. I which, was like, Oh is, my God, <laughs> what was this? <laughs> which, uh, which a lot of bands do. And I don't blame them for, you know, it's a lot of money. I don't, I don't know how much, but they probably got, you know, they could pay for all their kids colleges with that money. So, but that, that sort of thing would have been, unthinkable 30 years ago if nirvana had played like a corporate gig or something like that that would have been just like you know there was selling out and credibility those were incredibly but I mean, obviously as the music industry has eroded and streaming isn't paying very well people you know doing commercials and ads and corporate gigs isn't doesn't have the same stigma but it's definitely a lot has changed in the last 30 years in, re- in regards to the way things like that are received. Do you think that Nevermind also seems, now that you look back up on it and see everything that has happened with the music industry, uh, do you think that Nirvana predicted that uh, and never mind in the sense that it you know it debunked michael jackson's dangerous from the number one spot in in the u.s charts in july like a year almost a year after it came out obviously it took them it took it quite a while to do so but it did and then after that just you know grunge became pop You know, the the following years, you know, record labels started catering to the audiences that liked grunge because of the way that Nevermind overtook or took by storm the entire pop landscape. You know, do you think that it, it was also important in that sense, in, in, in the way that it predicted what the pop landscape was going to be 30 years later? Sure, it definitely expanded the parameters of what, what we considered pop, or what was what was uh, these kind of weird, what were used to be weird fringy bands were becoming pop bands. I mean, a few years after that, you know, Soundgarden, who were you know heavy distorted grunge band, came out with Black Hole Sun, which was a huge pop hit, Beatles esque pop hit. So uh, you could argue that it kind of opened the the floodgates for, for things like that. And obviously we hear, you know, there's still bands today that are, you know, obviously there's a lot of hand wringing about the death of guitar music, but then, you know, punk pop, pop, excuse me, punk pop comes back. And, and um, I mean, there's still, I mean, a lot of grunge bands still actually exist. And then the, the bands that they led to like, well, I mean, Stone Temple Pilots and then there was Bush and Silverchair and all these bands, some of whom exist, some of whom do not. I mean, obviously only of the big four at this point, only Pearl Jam exists in any, you know, consistent manner because of the, they have the only singer who's alive. I mean, well, Alice in Chains too, but they have a, a different singer, but you know, Pearl Jam has remained largely intact. They don't do as well as they used to, but probably by their own, you know, at some point they pulled back and they're also just not, you know, I, I think their moment has passed in some ways, but they still obviously are a huge draw. There's also something that calls my attention or that grabs my attention 30 years later, and it's the fact that the kid that posed for the cover, or not posed, but was there for the cover, the, the baby, the Nirvana baby, is suing the the band, you know? And it seems to complement what I'm telling you about how 
uh, visionary the entire piece of work was in the sense that here is in the cover of this, you know, important album, this baby chasing after a buck and 30 years later, there he is, you know, chasing after the dollar. Yeah, I mean, that when that lawsuit was filed, uh, what was it, last month or, or, or a few weeks ago, it was very divisive. I would talk about that. a lot of people on Twitter. Some people were like, well, he is, there he is, great, you know, chasing the dollar still. And then there were people like, hey, he deserves some money, you know. Um, I mean, I, I think, and I've read things about, you know, he, he claimed it was, you know, child porn, which is obviously something that, it's I ridiculous. A lot, of, uh, a lot of lawyers <laughs> and, and legal minds kind of dismiss, but I can't remember how much he or I, I think it was actually his dad was, was paid. Like 500 but, bucks? Uh, yeah, 500 bucks, something like that. Like, I think he deserves a little cut. I think, I think, I, I mean, what is, uh, what is, I mean, it, it was really, I mean, I think he, his claim was under like a million dollars from 15 different people or something. I mean, I think if Nirvana LLC would kick him a, a few dollars for, for, for this, I mean, who knows? I mean, he, had, he, had Spencer Eldon, the kid who grew up to be, I mean, he obviously promoted this at times. So, it is possible that it has had a big psychic toll on him. I can't say, I don't know him. I don't know what, what's going through his mind. Uh, you know, what it would be like to be, have your penis seen by everyone (laughs) in the world. But, um, I, I mean, I, I think some of, I think the, the lawsuit seemed overstated to me, but at the same time, I think he does deserve more than the $500, which he probably never got. I think it's more like a means to an end kind of thing the whole legal standpoint oh yeah i think i think i think they they want to make a big splash no pun intended with the with the lawsuit i mean it was a big deal uh obviously coming right in advance i mean it's been 30 years so um i think there was a definite publicity push behind it that, that's my sense just my speculation, but, uh, I mean, I hope he gets paid. So I'm sure they'll settle it out of court and he'll get a decent amount and we can move on from it. Absolutely agree with you on the fact that, um, he deserves on, 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 on your thoughts and your opinion that he deserves some money from it. I mean, he became a symbol of pop culture for the nineties and he should definitely get some money out of that. Not just the 500 bucks that it took to take the <laughs> pictures, you know? I, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see what happens. I'm sure it'll, but I, it, it, I, I suspect it'll get settled out of court somehow. I, I'm a hundred percent sure that it's gonna get settled out of court. By the way, they—that's not the only lawsuit that they've gotten hit with over the course of the years. You know, I remember reading something about the smiley face and the designer of the cover suing them or suing Marc Jacobs uh, for using that logo and uh, it being registered on the name of Kurt Cobain and it not being its uh, his original uh, design. You know, those guys got to be, you know, they got to deal with some crazy lawsuits because it, I guess, you know, Nevermind makes just a ton of money every year. Well, I mean, they've been dealing with, with legal hassle since the beginning. I mean, they, they, in order, there was another band named Nirvana when they came out. So, you know, a British band, I believe. So they had to kind of do a legal set month to get the, the rights to the, the band name Nirvana. So they, I'm sure, I'm sure this is, is not affecting the, the surviving members on a day to day basis. I'm sure they have a whole team of lawyers who take care of it and they don't really have to worry. I mean, I think the Spencer Elden, you know, Nirvana baby suit got a lot of attention and maybe was a little more contentious because it had some kind of very, sort of outrageous claims in it and um it was very divisive amongst the fandom so maybe maybe that might have affected them somewhat but who knows who knows i'm I'm sure they're lawyers yeah i'm sure they have great lawyers (laughs) do you think uh had nevermind not been that successful grunge would have still taken over uh the world the attention of the music world as it did right after Nevermind, because when you read Everybody Loves Our Town, you have a feeling that this was bound to happen. 
Like from the very beginning, when you start telling the story of the very first show that took place at Puget Sound in the Bay and the story of the Minuteman and everything that starts piling up and how it evolves and how, you know, many of them just or not many of them, but, you know, uh, um, Duff McKagan moves to California and becomes a part right. of an essential part of this, you know, hard rock world, you know, coming from Seattle, you know, being a part of Guns N' Roses. And you, you, you kind of get the feeling when you read Everybody Loves Our Town that, uh, yes, Nevermind was big, but it was going to happen anyway. What do you think? It's hard to tell. I mean, now in retrospect, and with hindsight, it feels inevitable <laughs> because of everything we know. But if Nirvana, maybe if Nirvana hadn't knocked down that door fully, there, I mean, there were there were albums before that that were coming out that were kind of chipping away at this. There was the Jane's Addiction album, Faith No More. You know, the alternative was becoming more mainstream. Maybe, I mean, you know, obviously, uh, Lollapalooza was starting up here in the United States. Um, so alternative, you know, it was, it might look different. It might've looked different. It might've been less grungy, more, uh, alternative-y. Uh, I, it's, it's really hard to tell. It's really hard to speculate. Um, I mean, I think grunge would have been a phenomenon, but whether it would have been as huge a phenomenon, it's hard to tell. I'm asking because Geffen was behind the entire promotion strategy. You know, and I wonder if Jane's Addiction had had that David Geffen pizzazz <laughs> to, um, to, well, or Faith on, No More, maybe, you know? Right. Well, they, they they had quite a push behind those albums. I mean, those things were on MTV all the time. And, and I mean, I think, I mean, I mean, even what's forgotten in the history a little bit is that Allison Chains had a hit with, with Man in the Box before this happened. So, I mean, they were more, there were always some people still looked askance at them because they were a little bit more metal than grunge, but you know, they got, they, they took over the mantle, you know, took on the mantle of grunge, but they had a big hit. So it was, it was something, it was happening. It was building up. Uh, could there have been another band? Could it have been, you know, Soundgarden or Pearl Jam or another band that that made the big break. I mean, it was it helped that there was this big cluster of bands that were so great, basically. You know, and we had the four big bands: Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, and Nirvana, and obviously many many others: the Mud Honeys and Tads and and some of the you know bands that were not quite so successful. But um, yeah, I think I, it's it's really hard to speculate. But I think there was something happening and all, the alternative was becoming mainstream. And I think that was unstoppable. Whether grunge would have become as big a deal as it was without Nevermind, hard to say. Is it the perfect grunge album? I don't think it's the perfect grunge album. I would say the perfect grunge album is Mud Honey, Super Fuzz, Big Muff, and Singles, which is just like the epitome of grunge, you know, grungy guitars. Um, with the sense of humor, touching me, I'm sick. It's like the perfect grunge album, anthem rather. Um, I don't see, I mean, the Nirvana album is like, I don't think there's not a bad song on it. I mean, some people object to the production, too glossy, too poppy, uh, which I can see, I can see. Um, but I, I would say the Mud Honey album and Mud Honey were being, you know, they and Nirvana were on the same label, Sub Pop, and at first Mud Honey were seen as the ones that were going to really break out and make it, and Nirvana were kind of the baby band, but it turned out to be just the opposite, I guess. It was pretty glossy. Everything was pretty glossy back then. I, you know, now that you mentioned glossy, like everything that was successful, I mean. Like the Black Album was also criticized. The Metallica Black Album was mm -hmm. also criticized by being produced for being produced by Bob Rock in a very glossy kind of style, kind of like hard rock kind of approach because, you right. know, he, he came from Motley Crue doing uh, Dr. Feel Good. And so was 10. You know, 10 did have that glossy feel oh, to yeah. it. It had a very classic rock sheen to it, which is also, I think, what we were talking about earlier. 
why I think people in the realm of alternative and indie and what we used to call college rock didn't really you know, like it as much because it sounded like classic rock in some ways. So, I mean, now it is classic rock. 30 years later, I hear all these songs. We have classic rock radio here in the United States. I hear all these songs. I hear uh, Pearl Jam and Nirvana and uh, Soundgarden, like Black Hole Sun, like alongside, you know, Bob Seger. And I mean, Metallica's thrown in there too. And, and, you know, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones just become part of the pantheon. How important was college rock radio back then for this movement? College rock was, I mean, I was in college back then, so I was at a radio station. It was pretty, it, it was pretty big movement. I mean, the, the, you know, uh, it, it, you know, in the last 30 years, it has become a lot less significant of force, but in the 80s and 90s, it, to get out a weird sounding band, like, I don't know, nobody was playing Uh, Nirvana's Bleach, except for college radio, um, you know, uh, it was it was a it was pretty big force. I mean, it was a it was you know there was a lot of uh, marketing and and efforts to get these records into the hands of college radio DJs. You know, was it big? Was it big? Uh, college radio, yeah. I mean, most most colleges had a radio station. Some bigger than than others. Um, what happened it to just, it? What happened to that? Why, <laughs> why didn't it? I mean, I think because, I think because, uh, the alternative, these weird bands entered the mainstream, it was just probably less, I mean, there's still, believe me, they, these, these college radio stations still exist, but, uh, I think it's just a lot less strong. There was a good article that people should look it up in the New Yorker about, uh, I think it's Khalifa Senna, the writer wrote about working at the Harvard university radio station back in the nineties and what that was like, uh, should look it up on the New Yorker.com. Um, and it was just, uh, I think it was a little bit different time. And I, I mean, I don't hear much about college radio these days and its influence and power. I just don't think it, it has that the kind of sway and there's probably not as much money to throw around at the, I mean, in the eighties and nineties, they could throw around a lot more money. Now the record companies are, you know, fixated on streaming and things like that. Well, listen, it's been great uh, talking about uh, Nevermind's 30th anniversary, catching up with you and uh, seeing you. I hope you're doing well. I hope you continue to do well. Let's look forward to that documentary happening. Yeah, I hope so. And uh, let's talk again on the 40th anniversary of Nevermind. Let's. Let's make that a plan. Mark Yarm, <laughs> author of Everybody Loves Our Town, writer, journalist. Thank you very much. It's always great talking to you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.